Well, we're going to be in, uh, we're going to read uh, actually John chapter 13. I was just going to read a selected portion, but I think we're just going to read it. John chapter 13, and we'll we'll read verses 1 through 17. I'm in the King James Version. If you could, if you could stand with me, <coughs> if it's okay, uh, as we read the word, we'll let Sister Sandy get it up there for us. King James Version, John 13, and we're going to read verses uh, 1 through 17. Amen. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil, how now, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And then cometh to he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter says unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter says unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus says to him, He that is washed needs not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, you are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Thank you, Father, for your word. Oh, Lord God, I pray that your word would go forth this morning and that you'd speak to us, your, your disciples, Lord. I'm believing you, Lord God, that you're making disciples. And that you would speak to our hearts and that your word would have its way with us, Lord, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that you would do what no man can do and that you would reach deep on the inside of us and minister to what we need this morning because you see us, Lord, right where we are. Have your way with us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. In this passage of Scripture, I see the Lord, He's... This is the night that he's going to be betrayed, right? This is the Passover night. John includes this foot washing ceremony within this scene. Um, he clothed himself in servanthood. Amen. And really, that's kind of what I want to talk to you about. A couple of concepts this morning I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you, first of all, about sonship. Because, you know, I've been talking about the father. And we've covered at least a couple of uh, passages or a couple of sermons already that talk about knowing the Father. And, and, but I also want to talk to you t t this morning about a couple of these concepts. Self-denial versus self-preservation. I'm going to just write it right here. Self-denial versus self-preservation. There's a lot of other things that I'm sure will come out, but these are some of the main concepts that the Lord was speaking to me through the passages that he gave to me. The text talks about the fact that he removed his garment and that he girded himself with a towel. I don't know what their towels looked like. It had to be long enough to where he had to tie it to himself. Right? And, and really the word gird is really where we get the word girdle. We don't hear that word used too much anymore. Right? But back whenever I was a young boy, sometimes women would wear girdles to try to kind of make their, their, their fat, their form, and look a little bit more fashionable. Right? And so, but the idea is that it's bind, it binds tightly. 
And so what he did was he removed his outer garment. Listen, throughout the scripture, the outer the garment means something. And we'll probably get to that in a moment. But, but nevertheless, he removed his outer garment. Some people have said it was a sign that he was removing his deity. Uh, and, and that's maybe, maybe so. We can see something like that. But he was, he was definitely lowering himself. And he was tying the servant's towel and girding it tightly to himself. And he was making himself a servant because he sat down and, and he began to wash their feet. And now, in order to understand, because really I'm, I'm talking to you also, I meant to put up their servanthood. Yes. I'm not going to go walk back over there, but keep servanthood in your mind. Yes. Because the title of my message is A Servant's Son. Mm. And we keep talking about the fact that, or at least I keep talking about the fact that I really need to know my father. I really need to know him. I need to know his heart because whatever I've been doing for all these years of my life is just not really working. I need to know him. And I learned something through the process. We started this journey whenever we read Psalm chapter 2 and I titled that message, Kiss the Sun. And then Aaron comes in here using that, didn't even know I used it. And man, I'll tell you, that message right there just blew me away about kissing the sun. And I realized that there's been times in my life where I came to the place of humility and brokenness. And I did. I kissed the sun. And, and then in the next message last week, I said he was my brother's. He's my he's my brother's father. And the point that I was trying to make with that is, is that the scripture says that no man has ever seen the father, but only the son who was in the bosom of the father. And then John in the same gospel describes not only was Jesus in the bosom of the father, but John says the disciple that Jesus loved found himself resting in the bosom of the son. And the revelation that I'm receiving is that if I'm going to know my father, because that's what my heart desperately wants to understand and to know, is the heart of my father. I will never know the heart of my father if I don't know his son. Amen. Amen. And I got to know his son. And I got to learn about his son from the, from the written word. The whole, but I need the Holy Spirit to make the written word the living word. Amen. 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 And, and so this morning I hope and pray that the Lord would go before us and he'd give us a revelation. But in this morning's message, servanthood. And I've titled this morning's message, A Servant Son. And, and, I, and I want you to know that we're seeing this. You know, the scripture says that Jesus was a servant. He's a king, but he's a servant. Sometimes we, we, we're not too opposed to being a son. We're, we're, there's a lot of talk in the church nowadays about sonship, right? About authority and power and dominion. Praise God for power and dominion. Praise God for authority that we've received in Christ. The exousia, the delegated authority given to us by the Father. Praise God we can walk in victory this morning because of Jesus and, and the victory that he won for us. We don't have to walk in defeat this morning, church. I need you to know that. That's the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord says that you have been given victory through Christ. Yeah. There's a lot of talk about sonship and power and dominion, but there's not a lot of talk about servanthood. I pray that the Lord would help us to get a revelation of what it means to be a servant. Mm -hmm. The only way we'll learn servanthood is if we learn our Jesus. You know, foot washing is a big deal in the ancient lands and the ancient text. Uh, Abraham, it actually says in the book of Abraham, whenever the Lord and the two angels, you remember the two that went to Sodom, showed up and Abraham rushes over there. He says, let me get some water fetched for you. You can wash your feet and you can rest a while. I'll go slay an animal and we'll cook for you. And when he said that, because you know, Abraham was a man that had a lot of servants. He was saying, go fetch the water so we can wash the feet. Not everybody had a servant, but it reminds me of the story. And I'm just trying to get you the point of washing the feet because I'm trying to get you the idea of the servanthood of Jesus. That we remember the woman we talked about her recently, the sinful woman with the alabaster box. And however she found out, she knew that Jesus was in there. She presses through. I believe there's a crowd. The text doesn't say it. But there's no question in my mind. There's a crowd. She presses through. She sees the religious eyes. She sees the stairs. She's focused. She's focused on Jesus. Nobody's going to get in her way. Come on, church. 
Don't let anybody get in your way. Don't let anybody look at you and deter you from getting a hold of your Jesus. He's the darling. He's the everything that you need. That's why we sing about him. That's why we worship him. That's why we honor him because he, he deserves his glory. So she comes up in there. She stands behind him. She begins weeping. And then the next thing you know, she's weeping with tears on his feet. Y'all know the story. And then she begins to wipe. And she, she's probably embarrassed. I'm thinking. And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm getting tears on the master's feet. And she says, says, with her hairs, she began to wipe the tears. And then she broke that alabaster box, that expensive perfume, and she anointed his feet. I love the gifts of the Spirit because Jesus, with a, with a word of knowledge, I mean, you can't get in. You don't want to talk about clarity and hearing from the Holy Ghost. Jesus, in, this, the Bible says that Simon the Pharisee said within himself, he said if he was really a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman this was. And Jesus said, Simon, I came into your house and you didn't even give me water yeah. for my feet. And here she is washing my feet with her tears. And she's anointed my feet. And so I wanted to make the point that, that this washing of the feet, a man like Simon would have had a servant. And anybody with any hospitality in those days, I mean, now, you know, I, I was saying this to the gym, people in the gym, like, you, if you go into somebody's house, they might offer you some water, some fresh juice or something. <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't juice, he wasn't water, right? The, the hospitality, and that was the basic thing right there, to get your feet washed, but they didn't even offer Jesus that. And so I want you to get a picture of what it was like. And so Jesus is actually taking upon himself the form of a servant when he girds the towel around him. And Peter's like, you're going to wash my feet? No, you're, you're not going to wash my feet. He said, if I don't wash you, then you're going to have no part of me. Right. My focal point really is not on foot washing ceremony. I don't know if you've ever been in one. Jesus ends up saying this, though. He says that the servant is not above his master. And, if, and do you see what I have done for you? Y'all you, remember reading it. We just read it. Do you see what I have done for you? Because what I have done for you, you are to do for one another. Do you think that he meant that we need to all take our shoes off and start washing each other's feet? Don't get me wrong. I don't know if you've ever been part of that, but that is a very, very humbling thing. I'm not going to ask you to take your feet off. I'm not going to ask. I got a weird. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say. Ever since I ran a marathon, I got this really weird looking toenail, and I don't want you to see. It. <laughs> but I have been in a foot washing ceremony that caught me off guard. When we were in Mexico with the Crossing Place Fellowship from Franklin with some youth. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the idea we're going to do a foot washing ceremony came up. And let me, I don't even know how to explain it. Because I'm going to tell you, all my religiosity wasn't feeling real good about it. And then the next thing you know, like I'm weeping like a baby in the middle, like weeping and weeping and weeping. Okay. Wow. All I know is this, is that what Jesus is trying to depict for us or what he is depicting for us is servanthood, humility, the laying down of self for the purpose of the father. And he wants you and I to understand that, that, that he wants you and I to have the heart of a servant. Amen. And to be able to, to learn how to serve one another. Mm. And, and I think we're going to get into some scripture this morning where we're going we're gonna to have to like determine in our hearts, who do we look like? Mm, that's good. Do we look like Jesus? Or do we look like the antagonists of the story? Mm. Who always show up when Jesus is around. And they're always causing trouble for Jesus. Amen. Come on. Which one are we going to look like? And listen to me, church. The reality of it is, is that we all, everybody in this room, if you're born again, we got a little bit of both in us. Come on. <laughs> Starting with the preacher. And, and the beautiful thing is this, is that I don't know about you and I don't know what your focal point of the scripture, like what you see as importance in the scripture, um, you know, on what you focus on in your own life as you study Jesus. But what I'm realizing more and more is that I want to know him. I want to honor him. I want to give him glory. I want him to receive glory in this church. 
And I can't make that happen. You know what I'm saying? I've come to the conclusion that, look, as much as my heart is, and I know y'all love the Lord. Y'all wouldn't be here if you didn't. But I realized, nah, just turn around and worship Jesus. <laughs> at least if I, I look at it like this. At least if I can stay focused on Jesus and focus on me and the Lord, that I know that, hallelujah, somebody's worshiping the Lord. And I'm believing that y'all are worshiping him too. My point is, is I can't make nobody do nothing. And even if I was going to, my motives would be right. But I know this. He deserves all the glory. Yeah. He deserves all the honor. Amen. Amen. He deserves his worship. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you, saints. I know he does. Amen. And so we're talking about servanthood. You know, Jesus was a servant. It says it in Philippians 2. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And the whole purpose of that passage is that so he could become a man so that he could serve the Father's will by dying. Amen. On the cross to set us free, to liberate us, to put us into the new covenant for the ministry of reconciliation to where you and I can have grace, access to grace in which we stand, in which we're changed. That's Romans 5. That you've been justified by faith. He made you righteous. Now you have access to grace. He wants to change you. Yes. He wants to yes. change me. Yes. We talked about that last week. That the father wants to see his son. When he looks at the right hand. Uh, the right side of his throne. He sees his son. He's like here I am dad. <laughs> look at these hands. <clears throat> look at that. Look at that wound. And when he looks upon the earth. He desires to see his son too. How else will the father receive his glory unless he sees his son, his beloved, when he looks? How else will he see his son, his beloved, when he looks at you unless Christ be formed in you? Unless Jesus be formed and fashioned on the inside of you. Amen. And sometimes we can put on the we can put on the outer garment, if you will. And we can we can put on an outer garment and we can look apart. At least for a little while, we can get away with it. Sooner, but that, but, but look, if, if what's shown on the outside isn't what's really on the inside, to some extent, that's the definition of hypocritos, where we get the word hypocrite. The word hypocrite literally means to be an actor on a stage with a mask. And so we put this mask on and we try to look one particular way, but then, but the Lord sees it all. Amen. Amen. And so what we really want is we want the Lord to have His way in here. And then that way what's reflected outwardly is really what's in our heart. That's a lifelong process. Amen. And so that's the ongoing journey. So he girds himself in servanthood to teach his disciples the truth about their service to the father. Amen. Our father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Praise God. You know. With all this talk about the sonship versus the servanthood, you know, most people, can I be real with you? And I'm not necessarily talking to you, but most people that sit in churches aren't really serving God. And, and, and why would I know so much about what I'm talking about? Because I myself have been there and I don't want to be there. Maybe some people say, well, I think you might still be there. Maybe a little bit, but I don't, I don't want that to be. What I'm trying to say is, is that a lot of times people that are sitting in churches are not really serving God. They're really serving themselves. They're really serving their own desires, their own will. Come on, somebody. Don't get mad at me when I get to preaching the truth. Just love me and remember that I got to speak the truth. Amen. You know, so they serve themselves in what they do. They do many times to be seen by men. Come on. Amen. Don't get mad. <laughs> That, that's a word. I, this is a big old fancy word. Ego centric. It's a fancy word. It's a compound word. Freud used this word. The weirdo Freud, he used ego to describe the self. That's what the word ego means. Self centric. It's another way to say center. Ego self centered. There's a song that. Yvette sings. And, and I, you know, and Jesus, you're the center of it all. Jesus, you're the center. Can you sing a little bit of that for us while I walk back up on the stage? 
Jesus be the center of it tree right there. See, we know, I'm not evil, no, but you sure are trying to look at, trying to get everybody to look at our good. We want to be recognized. There's a part to us that wants to be recognized. And, 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 and so we need to come to the realization that this is in us. Yeah. And that, and, and this is what I want you to understand. We all got it. And, and, but when we start to realize that it's in there and we can start to recognize it, we can ask the Lord to have his way with it. Amen. Praise God. No, that's good right there. Have your way, Lord. Amen. And, and, and because a servant isn't working for himself. A servant is working for his Lord. And that's the message today, a servant's son. The definition of a servant is literally this. A slave either willingly or unwillingly. Number two, one who gives himself up for another's will. Not my will, but your will be done. And you know, one thing I want to say is this. Jesus, the eternal son, served the father with absolute devotion. Amen. He did not serve the father that way in order to gain his sonship. He served the father because he is the son and the son serves his father's will. It's important that you understand that. It's important I understand that. You have been gifted your position as a son because of the son that died on the cross and he paid the penalty of your sin, amen? And now when you accept that for yourself, what happens? The scripture teaches that the spirit of God has now moved on the inside of you. You have now become the temple of the living God, Amen. The scripture also says this. Those that are led by the spirit, they are the what? The sons of God. Those that are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. Not those that are led by the flesh. Those that are led by the flesh are not the sons of God. Help us, Lord. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I know I need the Lord's help. Now, the father is looking for sons that will serve and it's not our kingdom, amen? It's his kingdom. But the problem that we have as humans is that we're very aware of ourselves and very consumed with the prospect of serving and preserving self. Self-preservation is a very telling symptom. It's a symptom that connects our fallen nature to the actions of the serpent. Because, listen to me, all you got to do is go backwards in time and all you got to do is look at the scripture and really kind of think about it. And my understanding of the scripture, and this is my position, and I've really tried to think about it in multiple ways. But the serpent had already rebelled against God before the earth was ever created. And his whole point was about himself. I will exalt myself above the throne of heaven. I will do this. I will ascend. I, okay, and then God creates heaven and earth and plants Adam, Adam creates the earth, sorry, creates the earth and then plants Adam and Eve or recreates the earth or however you want to do it, tohu, bohu, gap theory, we're not getting into all the details right now, but we're just trying to say this, he said, let there be light. Yeah. And when it's all said and done, we at least see this created place for Adam and Eve to be. And then the enemy comes in. Listen to me. What he's trying to do is trying to preserve himself That's right. by putting himself in mankind. 
by putting his rebellion That's inside right. of the That's hearts right. of human beings. And so when you and I begin to see this whole concept of self rising up, uh, amen, that's part of the fall. And it came from somewhere. But it's not the Lord. And the Lord wants to remove it. Amen. He wants us to allow him to remove it. And Jesus was able to see these traits in the lives of certain humans. Uh, let me ask you something. How offensive do you think it would be if somebody told you that you were of your father, the devil? I mean, could you imagine that? No, I'm just saying. I'm not saying. I'm not telling you that you're of your father, the devil. <laughs> I'm just wondering what you think that would feel like. And somebody said, you're of your father the devil in many. I think, I think I would be offended by that. Yet Jesus told that to the religious leaders. My point to this line of reasoning is that the message is a servant's son. And that was Jesus. And that's supposed to be us. And the servant doesn't live for himself or his own will. He lives for the will of his master. Therefore, if a believer is a servant's son, like his Lord, he will desire to live the will of the Father, not his own will. You know, I, wanna, I wanted to say um, this, too, that, um, you know, I had something in here, and I really, I, don't, I didn't know for sure if the Lord would want, but want me to say it. I feel like he does want me to say it. You know, serving the Lord is not always directly related to the local church, right? right. Something weird has happened in the church and I think it's all because of the self desire and the selfishness that many times people become so focused on the local assembly and the building of their own church or the building of their own thing that they lose sight of the larger picture. Does that make sense? But there's still something else that's really weird that's going on because it's almost like the local church is, is getting a bad name. It's like, yeah, but them pastors, you know, and you're, they're probably right. Most of us are probably not right. But, but my question is, is, is the local church the will of God? Absolutely. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me preach over here a little while. <laughs> when, you know, what, it, what the, the, the church, and, and you can't tell me that it's not God's will for the church. Right, right. Because the scripture is clear that it's God's will for the church. Even before the church was ever created, the synagogue is a congregation of God's people. Right, right. The temple was where the people of God congregated. Israel was a congregation of God's people made up of tribes, clans, and families. It is the desire of God, not the American way. It is the desire of God that the people of God, families of God, would serve God together. And that we would corporately become one in unity. Yeah. Hallelujah. And that we would learn how to love one another the way Jesus loved us and laid his life down for us. And we all got different kind of gifting. Somebody put a while back in group text a Swiss Army night. And I was like, it said the body of Christ. I'm like, hallelujah. Man, we all, the Lord's anointing us to walk in various aspects and in various ways. He's gifting us and he's anointing us. But the reality of it is, is that we're all so selfish in our own desires for what we want that we can't see the value of how God's working in somebody else. And self needs to die in order for God to really work on us. I can see that enemy over there with that Swiss Army eye trying to knock that pin out of there. Let me see if I can wiggle that saw out. Pop, pop, pop. Let me see if I can get that can opener out of there. Oh, yeah. Now I got it all loose. I'm going to start pulling it all apart. I'm going to disarray this whole thing. We don't even learn how to let Jesus have his way in us. Come on, church. That's the truth. And we need to learn how to die to self and recognize each other for how God desires to use us. Yeah. Because it's about something bigger than us as individuals. Yeah. It's about Jesus. It's about his honor. It's about his glory. It's about his kingdom. Yeah. We can't even get along with one another and learn how to really love one another. Yeah. No. <laughs> I keep thinking about that, that prodigal son story. I keep thinking about that. I want so bad for that brother to get over himself. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying? I want him to just... I want him to take off running before his brother even comes home. And I want him to run over and I want him to find him at that pig pen. That's what I want him to do. I want it so bad because that's what I want to do. <laughs> but, you know, and, and, but he can't. Because, see, I remember, I remember now why, why we're even talking about the prodigal son. When we talk about him, it's because 
He represents the Pharisees. He says it. He says, how many of you have a hundred sheep? If you lose one, go ahead and leave the nine and nine and go after the one. How many of you, like that woman that has ten pieces of silver, if she lost the one, she'd light a candle, she'd sweep, she'd search diligently till she found it. And then when she found it, she'd tell her neighbors, come and celebrate with me. I found that piece of silver. Then all of a sudden, see, because the Pharisees had already questioned him, and that's why he started talking about it. And he says, and there was a man that had <coughs> Oh, that whole thing. Yeah, we're, fo we're so focused on that boy about to eat them pig pods. <laughs> we're so focused. Don't do it, dude. You're about to sink so low you might not make it back. Don't eat the pig pod. And we're so focused on that. And then we forget that Jesus is like, really, let, let me tell you what he's doing. He's throwing egg in the face of the Pharisee. Mm -hmm. But let me just say this. Jesus came for the Pharisee. Yeah. When he was laying, when he was hanging on the cross, it, it, listen, you go back and you read the Matthew narrative. The world passes by and wags their head. There he is. Said he was going to save the world, can't even save himself. And then here comes religion saying the same thing. That's right. And you know what Jesus said? Father, forgive them. That's right. For they know not what they do. I got to tell you something, child of God. You, you and I need to learn how to say that to our Father. Father, forgive them. Yes. For they know not what they do. Because when people hurt you, yeah. I don't want to be obnoxious. Lord, help me not to be an obnoxious man. Mm. But can I say this? Welcome to the club. Mm, yeah. Can I just do that? Yes. Like, real quick? Yeah. Can I say welcome to the club? Because yes. I don't know how much you've been hurt, but I've been hurt. Yeah. And I know one thing. Jesus, you're the center. Yes. And everything revolves around you, Jesus, you. It's all about him. Yeah. From my heart to the heavens, mm. Jesus be the sin. Yeah. And if I'll keep him focused, all this other stuff will just start to fade. That's right. And I'll learn how to love like my Jesus. And I'll say, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive me because I ain't Jesus. <laughs> I want to be like him, but I'm not him. Father, forgive me. Forgive me for the hurt that I've allowed in my heart. Forgive me for allowing that. I already know about bitterness. I have preached about it how many times, but how sneaky is it? Yes. How deceptive is it? Trying to set you off and isolate you and get you away from your Jesus where your healing is? We got to we gotta get smarter, church. Come on. Not smart logically or cognitively, but we got to get smart spiritually. Yeah. We need yeah. to start being able to see this for what it is. Lord, help us. Yeah. We're in a war, man. Okay. I want that brother to act like is what I want, but he's one of them religious leaders. and They don't love. They don't. They hate. And when the elder brother sees his younger brother, all they can think about is how he's about to lose his possessions. That's what he's thinking about. I mean, I, I know I keep talking about it, but I'm thinking he's standing over there. He's like, hey, come, come over here. What's, what's this all about? He's called a servant over there. See, he'd have been happy if his brother would have actually been kept a servant, right? That's what I've been waiting for. Put that little brother under my heel. You go fetch the water for me and wash my friend's feet when they come over for my feet, right? He would have been happy for that. But he's sitting over there, and he said, what's going on over there? That's your brother. Your brother's come back, and your daddy has... Has killed the fatted calf. Mm. Amen. Yeah. And so when when when, when I, your brother, your brother and, and and he's and he's sitting back and he's watching this. And you know what he sees? He sees a robe and a ring. He, that man was going back to be a servant, but as soon as he said, "Father," he hadn't even got his repentance out yet. He said, "Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven, and I'm not." Get a robe and a ring. I know I've been talking about that. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're not here. None of that. Get a robe and a ring. What I'm trying to tell you is that your father sees you as a son. He is, is, but at the same time, we need to have a heart of a servant. Yes. We need to come to our father with humility and lower ourselves and be willing to serve others. People are hurting out there, my friend. And when I see that robe, man, I'm telling you the word identity screams out to me. And I see so many 
times in scripture about garments and identity. And I see how Adam and Eve, they were just naked before the Lord. And then the Lord clothed them with the skins of an innocent animal. And I see the identity of Christ in that. That's coming in the future, right? The sacrifice of the eternal son that's going to. But, but, but there's so many other places. The saints are dressed in, in the robes of righteousness. I and mean, then how did that guy get into the wedding feast without his garment? I don't know. But he's like, cast him out into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You want that outer garment. Look, Joshua the high priest in Zechariah, the scripture says Satan was standing at his right hand ready to accuse him and that his garments were filthy. But the Lord said, give him some clean garments. I want you to know your father in heaven, he's all about getting you some clean garments, my friend. One of the greatest stories, I don't know if I could write a whole book over it, but I'm telling you I could write a chapter. Jonathan. <laughs> oh man, I love that story. Some of y'all heard me talk about it. But Jonathan, and I think it's when you transition into chapter 17 after David killed Goliath. I didn't go back and look at it. But what I remember is this, is that Jonathan, it says he took his outer garment off. He took his robe off. You're going to tell me that that robe did not represent. When people looked at that robe there, that outer garment, you think they didn't say, hey, there he is right there. That's the king's son. That's the king's son. He's the next in line right there. You know what the scripture says? He took his garment off and he gave it to David. Yeah. That's something powerful in that, my yeah. friend. He stripped himself of his identity mm. and he gave it to the rightful king. Mm. See, Jesus, you're the rightful king. That's it. I'm going to have an identity. I'm going to have to find it in you. And let me tell you, Jonathan learned something because in, in the scene right before that, right before he takes that garment off and gives it to David, you know, it's pretty obvious who the grill king is anyway. Right. <laughs> you know, I never even noticed this before, but if you go backwards and David, the, the Abner the servant brings David over there, this wasn't even in my notes, but this is too good to pass up. The Abner the servant brings David over there to talk to Saul, and I'm assuming they're talking about the battle. That makes sense, right? And all of a sudden, one day I looked down in the text. I never saw that before. David's holding Goliath's head in his hand. Mm. And he's sitting there talking a message of victory. Mm. I know what, what did I tell him, King Saul? I'll tell you what I told him. I said, you come at me with spear and sword. I come at you in the name of the Lord. <laughs> and then old Goliath blood dripping on the sidewalk. I <laughs> hated that scene. But Jonathan got a revelation. I am not the rightful king. Mm. Come on. I need to serve my king. Here's my identity. I give it to you. You're the next in line. You're the rightful heir to the throne. Jesus. You and I need to learn how to have that servant's heart. And I need you to understand that you have an identity. And it's waiting for you. And the Lord wants to clothe you with it. Your father loves you. He's proven his love. He sent his son. And he wants to clothe you in his son. When I look at that brother, though, you know, I'm seeing some stuff in him. Envy. I mean, I don't know. I could get up there and I could get you to list some things out. Envy and jealousy. We'll start with that, right? Probably anger. Irritation. Why is he mad? I mean, no, seriously. I mean, is he mad because what? His brother's getting a promotion? That he's going to lose his stuff? Come on, Christian. Help me out here. How many times do we take matters into our own hands? And when we see that, some, oh, I'm about to lose this. I'm about to lose that. Oh, what am I going to do? i got to fix this situation. How many times do we say, Lord, you're my defender, yet we take our own defense? I've told the story about how I went to go get my daughter. Oh, Lord, I don't want to talk about other people's business. But look, the Lord said, you're always trying to be two steps ahead of me, son. You're always trying to figure everything out. And on my way to what the Lord was telling me to do, I had already made three to four phone calls lining up my various options, even after the Lord told me that. And I'm not the only one, my friend. Trust me. All of us are trying to, through various types of manipulation, machinations, yeah. What is that fancy word for me? And you trying to take matters in your own hands and figure it all out, build it up and fix it. That's right. We got to learn how to let the Lord out of his way. Oh, Lord. And we need to start to learn how to recognize when these things are in our heart. The jealousy, the envy, 
the irritation, the anger. I'm not trying to say that we never get frustrated. That's not what I'm trying to say. That's not reality. I'm just trying to make a point. Matters of the heart. Whenever Peter says this, sanctify the Lord in your heart and always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. Did he not say that? That means the word sanctified means to be separated out. The Lord is, the Peter is saying, make sure the Lord is separated out in your heart. I'm trying to tell you that the stuff that's going on inside this brother's heart has no place in the heart of the believer. Yeah. Anger, bitterness, envy, irritation. All of us as humans, y'all know what I'm talking about because you've all felt it. Yes. Some of you walked in here this morning with it in your heart. We gotta learn to yield it to the Lord. It's a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit where He heals you. And listen, a lot of times it's all rooted in unforgiveness. Try to live your life like that, my friend, with unforgiveness. I'm telling you right now, whatever the Lord revealed to you right now, when I said the word unforgiveness, you better start forgiving people in your heart. If you don't forgive people in your heart, Y'all know, know what I'm talking about? Yeah. There's healing that's available. <clears throat> you know, this is the difference between the servanthood of Jesus versus the superiority of the Pharisees. You know, God said Israel was his firstborn too in Exodus 4, but Israel as a son is operating in superiority. I'm saying the Pharisees are a type of the nation. They're operating in superiority. Jesus as a son is a servant. The Pharisees are all about protecting their lives and their position. Jesus is all about laying down his life to please his father and further his father's kingdom. What does that look like? You know what I'm saying? Like even in the local church, like what, what that's what I'm trying to say. Are we about building this particular king? You know, this is one thing that I'll tell you about the word church. And you, and you may already know this, but this is the word church at that's one word right there. Ecclesia. Anybody know what this word means? This is a prepositional. This word means out. Anybody know what this word means? It's a variant of the word call. Call out. You're called out once. If you're born again this morning, if you're born again this morning, if you've been converted, that means that the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. And that makes you different. If you're not born again this morning, then, then you're not called out. And that's, a, and that's a good word. Because it's very important that you get born again. So, we, you know, many times in the church we have this conversation. Can you lose your salvation? I guarantee I could call on three or four different people and we could get two different opinions. You know what? I'm not even really that worried about it. Well, I am worried about it. Uh, because, because if I'm losing my salvation, it means I'm going in the opposite direction of God. But, but let's just say this. The, que the real question that we have to ask ourselves is, <laughs> are we saved? <laughs> right? I mean, and if we're saved, <coughs> that means the Holy Spirit lives in our heart. And if, we live in, if the Holy Spirit lives in our heart, that means the Holy Spirit's convicting us and yes. leading and guiding us to go into the right direction yes. to work towards the Father's will. Yes. Not our own will, but His will. But, but then yet at the same time, we can rebel against that will. Have we not all rebelled against the will of God? We've all rebelled against the will of God. I don't know about you, but I want to get to the place where I don't want to rebel against the will of God. Amen. I want, I want to be submissive to the will of God. And let him have his way <laughs> in my heart. So look, I want to I share with you a particular passage of scripture where I believe that this idea of self-preservation and uh, the motives of the religious mind are really revealed. But before we get to that passage, let's take a look at, at the motives of the religious mind so that we can see if sometimes these things are in us. Amen. I don't know about you, but I want, you know, this is this morning when I was praying, I said, Lord, give me the heart of the psalmist. Examine my heart and try my reins. Really, Lord, please examine me and inspect me and reveal to me what's really in me. Amen. It, it says in Matthew 23, verses five through seven, and I'm still in the King James. He said, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. 
They made broad their phylacteries, which is like box on their head, because the bigger it was, the more holy they looked. And they enlarged the borders of their garments. They want everybody to see that they're, you know, a religious person. They loved the uppermost rooms at the feast. The ESV says they loved the place of honor at the feast. And the chief seats in the synagogues. They want the best seat in the house. And greetings in the markets and to be called of men. Rabbi, Rabbi, great message the other day, Rabbi. Good job. Man, that was really amazing what you did. And if we're honest, we all like a little bit of that attaboy stuff. <laughs> Come on, attaboy. You really got it today. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I want to do a good job for the Lord. I want to bring a spirit of excellence to the to the house of God. But but look, there's something that Jesus Jesus put this in here, and He's letting us know that 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 the spirit of religion wants to be seen. Yes. And if we see that in ourselves, we need to let the Lord have His way. It's called crucifixion of the flesh. Come on. This is them. They want people to know what they did. And if you try to, and look, this is where it gets really sneaky. If you try to take that adulation away from them, it's a fancy word for if you try to take that honor away from them. Yeah. Look, I'm even talking about, I'm even talking about human beings today. If you try to take away their recognition, yeah. they may not try to nail you to a literal cross. <laughs> but I'm telling you right now, something's already yeah. brewing in them. Something's brewing in them. If you try to take away that recognition, that honor, that stuff that they believe belongs to them, boy, I tell you, something gets stirred up on the inside. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at this right here. And before we do this, I had this illustration in here. I didn't know for sure if I was going to use it, but I'm going to do it. You know, the first, the, listen, the deeper we get into the word and the more we begin to see the heart of our Jesus and the more we allow that to be revealed to us, amen, and we bring these things and he starts cleaning these things out of our heart and out of our life. Y'all remember that old illustration Brother Larson used about 9-11 and how there was this huge pile of rubble and at the bottom he said I noticed one day there were dump, truck, dump trucks going in and out he said it took a long time but before you know it there was no more rubble and that's kind of like the process of looking more like Jesus the Holy Spirit's working he's coming in he's pulling it out he's coming in he's pulling it out as long as we don't put up a roadblock and prevent the movement of the debris right but what I was trying to say too though is this is that is that many times um well, this is something that I've learned. The, the, the closer I, the more clarity the Holy Spirit gives me in the word. And the more I see myself in the word. And the more I yield to the Holy Spirit and ask him to have his way in me. And then he starts pulling that stuff out. Amen. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? And, and the more that happens, <coughs> the further away I'm getting from the ways of the world and from the things of the fall. I know that when I see him, I will be like he is. But in the process, I'm supposed to be being fashioned into his image. I'll get what I'm saying. But the further away I get from that, the more easily it is to recognize something that's abnormal. Now, this is kind of like a weird illustration, but it popped in my head. I'm going to use it. Things that, that we have in America, if we go to Mexico, it's a lot different. Okay, this is something that happened. When I went to Mexico last year, I went to preach at a rehab. And I had to, I'm gonna just try to be okay here. I had to do number one, <laughs> okay? So I go to the door and I go to open the door because you know in America, I don't know about you, but when I go into a bathroom, I make sure about three times it's locked <laughs> because I'm not trying to get anybody to walk in on me. I go to the door, I open the door and the door just swings open and there's a guy on the toilet. But this is what was really weird. The, 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 the floor was full of water, like it was coming out of the toilet. And, and the whole floor was full of water, and he was just sitting there like this was normal. And, and what I'm trying to get at is, is that for me in my mind, and I was just kind of like frozen, like I'm taking in all of this information, and, I'm, and he was just like, hold on. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, dude, this is so abnormal. And it just hit me yesterday when I was, but that's not normal. That that's not normal for me. And I'm from, I'm from a far away place from that. 
and, and but yet at the same time, the, the the remnants of the fall so oftentimes are not being removed far away enough from us. The things of the world are not being removed far enough away from us, and so we still think that the things of the world are normal, right. and it's not normal. Right. We still think that envy and jealousy and taking matters into our own hands are normal. No, they're not. It's not normal because it's the opposite of our Jesus. And when we yield to Him and let Him have His way, He's moving yes. stuff in us. He's taking stuff out of us, and He's trying to reveal to us. See, we need a biblical worldview. Yeah, that's so good. We need to view the world through the lens of the Bible. Yeah. I've been telling that to people a lot in the, in the clinic because I know that they think I'm weird. <laughs> you, look, you, some people have a, a, a Fox News worldview. Yes. <laughs> Come on. Some people have a, even a Newsmax worldview. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I have a problem? Lord help me. I have a problem with this. Well, let me not even get into that. I don't want to <laughs> Some people have a CNN worldview, an MSNBC worldview. I want a biblical world. That's That's it. It. That's I want to see the world Amen. through the lens of the scripture. Amen. And sometimes Fox News lines up with that, but sometimes they don't. That's right. Sometimes Newsmax lines up with that, but sometimes they don't. Come on. Sometimes CNN might even line up with that, believe it or not. MSNBC, I can't even look at it. Okay, sorry. But that, I didn't mean to get political. Word from I didn't think I got political. I was just trying to make it better. All right, here we go. John chapter 11. Because I want to show you some of the stuff that's in these, that, these religious leaders. And this is a lot of scripture, but I don't apologize for reading Amen. scripture. Amen? John chapter 11, verse 46 through 53 in the ESV version. It says, uh, but some of them, John 11, 46. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So he's performing miracles, right? He's stirring stuff up. And so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we going to do? What are we to do for this man performs many signs? Look at this. And if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Okay, and, and, and whenever you look, if you go backwards in the story in John 9 and 22, the blind, you remember the blind man where Jesus put the clay on his eyes? And, then, and, then they, and the Pharisees are really mad about this because Jesus broke their Sabbath. And they go and they find his parents and they say, how did this man open his eyes? And then in another place, they ask the, 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 the blind man that's not can see. They said, this man's a sinner. And the parents say, how he opened his, blind, his eyes, I don't know. I know he was born blind, and I know now he sees. And then the blind man says, oh, he's a sinner. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. All I know is this, I used to be blind, and yeah, now yeah. I see. Hallelujah. <laughs> but, but look what he says. So this has already happened. And then because of that, but the parents were kind of scared. They answered the question the way they did. Whether and how he got healed, we don't, we don't know who did it, how they did it. All we know is that he was, you're right, he was born blind, but now he sees. But it says they were, they were scared because the Pharisees had already warned that if anybody would believe that Jesus was Messiah, they would be kicked out of synagogue. Right, right. So they already know, these religious leaders already know people were calling him Messiah. They already know that people are talking because if he's Messiah, he's got to be the son of David. And y'all got to understand this. We got to learn the Bible. <laughs> he said, he, he, he's the son of David. He's the Messiah. People are saying this. And the Pharisees know that people are saying this. And the Pharisees themselves been waiting for over 2,000 years, at least 1,000 years for him to show up because all the prophecy showed that he was coming. And they've been waiting all of this time. And this is what they said. They say, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. It'd be almost like if there was a church that started up down the road. And it was like the word out on the street was, man, there's some really good stuff happening at that church. And, and, so, and Pastor Matt or another pastor would be like, man, we got to find some dirt on this dude. We got to find some dirt on this dude. We got to stop this situation. Everybody's leaving the church and going over there. That, can you wrap your mind around that? They've been waiting all this time for the Messiah to show up. And look what it says. It says, 
If we let him go on like this, everyone's going to believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. They're going to take away our position. Wow. You let the Holy Spirit speak to you on that. But look at this. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. I mean, do you see that? And that's another thing. Look at this, man. We're talking about the gifts of the spirit here. <laughs> this man prophesied this, but, is, but he's planning his death. He okayed his death. He prophesied the death of Jesus, and so we got to understand. Anyway, that wasn't my message. <laughs> but what amazing audacity. These people are recognizing, they already, people are starting to recognize these Messiah. He's performing miracles, and instead of embracing him as the long-awaited Messiah, they plot his death so they can preserve their position. And again, how often do these things show up in our family relationships Preservation of self instead of trusting God and allow the dying of self. How often do the thoughts of our heart plot and the words of our mouth speak malice and slander and harm onto people's lives? Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. In the real life comparison and contrast between Jesus and the Pharisees, we see a battle for us between the fallen nature that we got from Adam and the fallen, the divine nature we see from Jesus in the new birth. The Pharisees' father was the devil. They're trying to protect. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. They're trying to protect their position. They don't want Jesus to have his place. What will happen to us, they say? The struggle of the spirit in the flesh. Scripture says his winnowing fan is in his hand. He will bring the wheat into the storage house and burn away the chaff with unquenchable fire. Lord, refine us. Amen. The scripture does talk about refining fire, by the way. It does talk about removing impurities from our heart, right? That's a good thing. Look, I thought this was good right here. Y'all ready? This is another long passage of scripture, but we're getting close to being done. Jesus reveals the paternity test. Y'all ready? The paternity test is the word of God. Here we go. John chapter 8, verses 28 through 47. Then said Jesus unto them, when you have lifted up the son of man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things, and he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed on him, and then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. This is what Jesus said to those Jews that said that they believed on him. This is what he said right here. If you continue in my word. I put a little note in my, in my, in my margin that says the word continue means the same word as abide. It's the same word that's used in John 15. Abide in me and I in you. For apart from me you can do nothing. The word abide means to live in a place. To dwell there. Y'all following me? I'm putting you to sleep with all this good information. He says, if you abide in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. Listen, for many times, for a long time in the church, we've kind of beat people up because they didn't read their word, right? Y'all ever been in church? Like, kind of like a form of legalism. Oh, you gotta read it. Okay, but you gotta read your word. That's right, that's true. <laughs> How, y'all, you understand what I'm talking about? How are we gonna know Jesus if we don't get into the word, right? That a disciple is a learner of Christ. He's saying this is a biblical. This is really another way of saying you need to have a biblical worldview. He's saying if you abide in my word, then you will be my disciples indeed, and and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, and they said, "We be Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any man. How can you say such a thing?" That you shall be made free. And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now, I want you to know that in the Greek language, that's a present tense active word. Right. Committeth. 
The English language, the old English language, it throws that F on there. It means it's present tense. In other words, it's going on now and it's active. The, the subject of the sentence is performing the action. So, so what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that, that the person that is actively committing sin is currently a slave to sin. Wow. Now, everybody sitting in this room this morning has been in a place in your life where you were actively committing sin. And I'm not trying to say any of that to make anybody feel bad because Lord knows Pastor Matt's been in that place. But I'm here to tell you the good news that Jesus did. He died to set you free from that, Amen. from the bondage of that, yeah. to give you freedom from that. And if you will continue, abide in his word, that means to live there. That means you have to live your life according to his word, by his grace. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. Jesus goes on to say, he says, I know that you are Abraham's seed in verse 37, but you seek to kill me. I'm sorry, he says, he, let's go back to verse 34. He says, he that committed sin is the servant of sin, verse 35. And the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen of my, with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. And they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus says unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. What is the work of Abraham? Believe. Faith. The father of the faith. He believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. <laughs> you know, Christian, let me just say this. And then he says this. This did not Abraham. In other words, Abraham didn't do that. Abraham didn't hear a man tell the truth and turn around and want to kill him. Right. Abraham heard the truth and believed. Amen. And you know what I would say to people, because look, it's not just you. So we've got a few people that watch these videos. I would, I would tell people you need to be in the house of God, but I'd also tell you, you need to find that. You need to find a place where, what, what do we, what do we, what is our decision on where we go to church? Now, I'm not asking you to answer it. Where the Bible's preached. Okay, where the Bible's preached. Praise God. I'm not really, but thank you. I appreciate that. But I'm not asking you to really answer because there may be a bunch of different opinions. Right? But I want you to think about it. What do you believe is the is what causes you to make a decision on where you're going to go to church? Is it because they got a, I'm just saying, like, is it because they got a good youth group for your young people? Is it because they have a good children's ministry for your children? Because I'm going to tell you, sometimes I look back at churches that I had been exposed to in the past and they didn't have a youth ministry and they didn't have a children's ministry. And back in those days, the kids had a color sheet and they color underneath the chair and the parents actually taught their children at home the word of God and their parents actually disciplined their children uh, and, and taught them the things of God and that those kids were equipped to make a decision and sometimes they were very well behaved and sometimes I wonder if that's even what we're supposed to be doing. But that's just another story for another time because we have youth ministry and I'm thankful for our youth ministry and as long as we're preaching the truth, that's what's important to me about youth ministry. And I pray for our youth and I pray for our children. But I'm just curious, is that the decision that we make? Because not every youth ministry, they're preaching the truth. and not, I can tell you that for a fact. That that's not what's being done in, mo in many, many youth ministries in America today. I know it for a fact. Amen. Same goes with children's ministry. Mm. And, and, and so what is it? Is it because they have people that we like at that church? I, I mean, I didn't, I, I don't, I'm, just, I'm just asking the question. What is the reason that we choose what church we're going to go to? 
Because, because, you know, whenever we're talking about serving the Lord, I didn't get in all that. But let me say this, you know, a lot, there's a, there's something that's going on in the world today, in the church world today. You can find your favorite preacher on YouTube. You don't even need a church. According to the way things are going in the world. Right? I mean, in other words, now that's not consistent with the Bible. But what I'm saying is, if you if you got a preacher that you like, you can go find him this afternoon. Especially if you didn't like my message today, I promise you, if you got something you wanted to hear, you can go find it. You know how, like, in Morgan City, people say, buy local, right? And they're like, hey, I'm going to go down here to such and such paint store, and I'm going to buy my paint from over there because it's local. I wish people felt that way about the local church, and I'm not even really necessarily talking about you making this your local church. I mean, I believe some of you have. What I'm trying to say is, is that, you know what, we got to find a determination on what we think is important in the church. And once we do, we need to be in the house of God, and we need to be willing to serve. Amen. Serve Him. Yeah. Not serve, not, yes, then in some way, shape, or form, you're helping the pastor to do what we believe is God's will. What do I believe is God's will? Jesus needs to get his glory and his honor in this house. He needs to get it in our worship. He needs to get it in the preaching of the truth. The saints of God need to be equipped to do the work of the ministry. And on the outside of these walls, you as a child of God are going to be given opportunities to live your life in front of a lost and dying world. And every now and then you're going to be able to say something about your Jesus. And hallelujah. Sometimes they might even show up because they want to come to church with you. And unfortunately, many times they may not want to stay. But if they get converted, hallelujah. If the Lord will show up and change their hearts. And the spirit of move on the inside of them. And they hear the word of truth. And it resonates in their spirit. Then they may not want to leave. Right. I don't know that the church was ever meant to be an evangelistic claim. Mm. I mean, maybe you think I'm wrong. You may think I'm wrong. And it's okay. We don't have to agree on everything. I'm not saying don't invite your friends to church. I'm not convinced the church was ever meant to be an evangelistic plan. I am convinced that the church was meant to be the called out one. Yeah. Where the people of God become equipped. Yeah. And the saints of God become equipped. Yeah. Where they get built up. Where they get edified. Where they learn Jesus. Where they die to self and Christ is fashioned and formed in them. Where they're told that envy and jealousy and malice and bitterness in your heart is not okay for it to stay there. Because it doesn't look like the Lord. Where they're told that... You will, they will know you're my disciples for the love that you have for one another. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Lord, help us. That's good. Help us. And you know what else I know? That if I'm not talking to you, you don't even feel bad right now. Right? Isn't that the way it should be? In other words, what I'm trying to get at is if you don't have malice and envy and jealousy in your heart, you don't even feel weird right now. You ought to be just like, amen, Brother Matt. Or even if you got a little bit of it and you know it's the truth, you'd be like, amen, Brother Matt. Like Brother Lars is preaching, Brother Matt, because it's the truth. It's the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That's right. How do I get it out? I yield. I die myself. All right. He said, now you seek to kill me, a man that told you the truth. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder about that too. <laughs> Sometimes maybe people, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong on that. I like people to tell me the truth. Yes, Lord. I like the way that makes me feel. Jesus. I like that truth. Jesus. Makes me feel all bad on the inside. But refreshing it comes with repentance. Yes, yes. That's really the way it's supposed to work, my yes. friend. You, the word goes forth. You see something in you. You take it to the Lord. He removes the burden. Hallelujah. And it comes in with the refreshing of your soul. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That's how it works. That's the word of God in Acts chapter 2. Jesus. Repentance does a marvelous thing Amen. for our heart. You, and then so then this is the paternity test. Jesus says, you do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not of born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. <laughs> Amen. If God were your father, you would love me. 
If God were my father, I would love you. Even if you hurt me. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Even if you hurt me. Even if you told me that my father was the devil. I would love you. Maybe not right that second. <laughs> but I know what I'm supposed to do. If somebody tells me my father is the devil, I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to get my heart right. Huh? He goes on to say this. He says, verse 43, why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Yes. You know, I used to feel so bad for so long. Can I just be transparent with you for a little bit? I used to feel so bad for so long. I'd study, I'd try to prepare, and then, and then people would say, I just don't understand what you're saying. I just, I just don't understand what you're saying. I don't get it. And, and dude, I feel so bad in my heart because I'm just like, man, I tried so hard and I know that it's not about me doing the best I can do even though I want to do the best I can do. It's really about the Holy Spirit revealing to people. And, and, and I read this and I think, I mean, I'm, I know I'm not Jesus, but I'm preaching Jesus and I'm preaching his word. I'm just reading it to you right now. I'm not even really interpreting it. I don't think I'm reading it to you. And he says, why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Many times people can't hear because they don't have ears to hear. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. That's right. You, I'm not going to deconstruct that. I got some opinions. You do the deeds of your father. And then they said to him, we be not a for, born of fornication. We have one father. Let me just say this too. Pastor Matt sat in the church for 12 years and didn't understand half of what the Bible said. So whenever I'm preaching to anybody else, I'm preaching to myself first. Yep. He says, Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me for I proceed forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's words. You therefore hear them not because you are not of God. Amen. Jesus, the darling of heaven, the lover of the human soul. He just, he just, he ain't got time to play around, man. He's just telling it like it is. And many times we won't surrender to the will of God. We won't surrender to the word of God. Come on, somebody. Help me out here, church. We won't surrender to the will of God. We won't surrender to the word of God. We don't understand the things of God. But you are my disciples indeed if you continue and abide in my word. What does that mean? It means that if I don't understand something, I'm going to bring it to the Lord. I'm going to be like, Lord, I need to understand your word. I want to be a disciple. Amen. But, but listen, churches are being built on something else. I know I seem like an angry preacher. I'm telling you, churches are being built on something else. I went to a Bible college where they taught us the whole process of the emergent church. I took classes. I wrote papers. This is what seminaries are pumping out. They're not pumping out preach the Jesus of the Bible. I'm not saying none of them are. Please understand what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to tell you mainstream uh, evangelical seminaries are not teaching. I, listen, I had one professor. Danielle and I were talking about it. Y'all heard me say this. He said, it doesn't, this is, I'll never forget this, VHS. I was taping that was before they had it online. Stuck it in there. One of the first things he said is, it doesn't matter if you preach the gospel in error on purpose or accident, the result is the same. It leads to bondage instead of freedom. I was like, dude, that right there is the truth. I took every class that German scholar and held uh, Professor Wyckoff. I'm like, everybody else was running away from that dude. I was running to him. Come on. Let me, let me write another paper on the Pauline epistles. 
Let me write on Ephesians. Let me write on Galatians. Let me understand the heart of Paul because he understood the heart of Jesus. And he taught us that we must be crucified. That self must die so that Christ, he said, I keep saying it, but I can't get it out of my heart. How I travail. How I be like a woman in labor until Christ be formed in you. And the Father wants to see his beloved in you and I. He wants to see that in you and I, and he's done everything that we need him to do in order to do it. Will we yield? Will Pastor Matt yield? I want to yield. Which of you convict me of sin? Jesus. He that is of God hears God's words. You therefore hear them not because you are not of God. Now listen. Go to Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 in this, and I'm going to close with this. There's more I could say, but I want to, I just want to close with this because I do, I don't want to leave you in this particular spot. I want to remind you that there is a process. Yes. There is a process. You're immediately sanctified in Christ. Your spirit's been made one with the spirit of Jesus. You and him, with the Holy Spirit, you and him have become one. Right. And praise God, according to the word of God, you already got the mind of Christ. Unfortunately, most of the time we're not using his mind. We're using our own. That's, right. that's why our mind must be renewed. That's right. Amen. And so that's the process of sanctification is that our mind is becoming renewed and that we're learning who Jesus is and we're learning who we are and we're asking God to crucify us so that Christ can be formed in us. Amen. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Praise God. And I want you to know I'm taking, this is not the exact context, but, but it's still a spiritual truth. The exact context is that the Apostle Paul is telling the Galatian church, why are you listening to those men that are telling you that you have to be circumcised to be right with God? And then he goes back and he tells them Israel was under the law for a period of time. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to the place where we are now where Jesus has come. But this truth about the servant versus the son is still true for you and I in this particular thing we're talking about. That there's a process that sometimes we don't even understand that we're a son and we're still living like a servant. Does that make sense? All right, here it says in verse one. Now I say the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant. Though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed by the Father. So he's talking about something different, but let me just say this. This is true spiritually. If you and I do not understand that we are the heir of God, if you and I do not understand that we are recreated in the Son of God, if you and I don't understand that we have been made sons because of the Son of God, that we could still be living our lives like a servant, not operating in the power that the Lord has already provided for us, not yielding to the work of the Lord that he's already done for us. Oh, no, we can word it. We can spit it out. You know, I mean, anyway, a kid knows what his daddy named the animals. You know, that's Bessie, our best milk cow over there. You know what I mean? They, they know what daddy's business a little bit, but they're not, they can't, they can't run the plantation. Right, right. They can't run the farm because they're still, they're still operating as a servant. That's right. they, they own everything, but they don't, they don't understand. And he says, until the time appointed by the father, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. <laughs> wow. I don't know what other people are treating you like, my friend. But I'm here to tell you God's madly in love with you because he, yeah, he's unproven it. And he, and he sent his spirit into your heart. And the spirit in your heart should be crying, Abba, Father. Daddy God, you are my father. Crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Amen. Sayers, musicians, if y'all can come forward, we're going to go ahead and close. <coughs> I had some other passages. It always takes them a little while to get set up. So while they're getting set up, I'm just going to tell you this passage out of Romans 6. He says this, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. But in verse 17, he says, But God be thanked 
you were the servants of sin. But look at this. Because you remember, what did Jesus say? If you continue in what? Y'all remember I use a lot of words today, huh? In my word. If you continue in my word, you become what? My disciples indeed. Right? He says in Romans right here, he says this. But thank God that you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Wow. What? What? How do you interpret that scripture? How, you know how I interpret that scripture? The truth of God's word was given to you. You yielded to the truth and you were made free from sin. I don't know how else is that. That's, being then made free from sin. You be, can, can you go back one more verse? But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed, not in your own strength. Through the grace of God, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. you does everybody know what the word doctrine means? I don't mean that silly because some people don't know. Do y'all know what the word doctrine means? The word means instruction. You obeyed the instruction that was given to you from your heart. And what did it do? It made you free from sin. And you became a servant of righteousness. Praise God. I don't know if you're going through something this morning. I want you to know the altars as always are open. Praise God. I'd love to pray with you. They're going to sing us a song. Church is dismissed if you need to go. But they're going to sing us a song. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to worship him just a little bit longer. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus.